Indians have always had a clear idea of who they are and what their history was. But as there was no question, they had no voice. The story here for me begins with the Kingston and Gananoque Mississauga Ojibwe. They were nomadic hunters and gatherers. They were being marginalized into the unsettled areas of Upper Canada. At Grape Island, there were two schools for carpentry and home economics. They were silenced from their language, and in, in losing their language, they lost their culture and their, their traditions. So um, they, they only spoke Ojibwe in their minds or in, in, in closed quarters where they couldn't be, be caught because it was punishable. We were placed on reservations. We couldn't leave the reserve until we signed a, a, a paper permitting us to leave the reserve. And we had to sign on that paper how many days we're going and how, when will we be back. And also who our relatives are on that paper because if we don't come back, our relatives are rounded up and put in jail until we do come back. They took all the kids and put them in residential schools. And those kids, they weren't to talk their language. They weren't to believe in equality that Creator gave us that we were created equal with land, plants, and animals, but instead that God gave dominion of land, plants, and animals to human beings. It was part of Sir Johnny Macdonald's national dream to populate Canada. The Métis wanted to be a part of that. Louis Riel had a strong faith in the government. He believed that they would believe he was taking up this uh, opposition because of what he wanted for his people. In actuality, Louis Riel was taken to Regina and he was executed on November 16th, 1885. Um, it is speculated that for Johnny McDonnell, it was um, easier to have one man sacrifice than to admit that the voice of the people in the Northwest Territories had gone unanswered. At the end of the 19th century, it was just assumed that in about 50 years, there'd be no more Indians left. They'd, they'd all be gone. In 1992, Olive published her ultimate work, Canada's First Nations, a landmark both in Canadian history and in worldwide contact history, for the first time providing a complete historical overview of Canadian Aboriginal societies, the story of what had been evolving for centuries and how it all changed when the Europeans came into their midst. It is a book about history that has changed history, both the perceptions of what happened in the past and what would have to happen in the future. Dr. Dickinson's work is one of the few defensible documentations of our true history in this country. So it's great for the politicians to get up and talk about it all they want, but without the academic rigor and, uh, and the contribution that Dr. Dickinson has made, uh, we, we wouldn't have as much of a leg to stand on that we do now. And I have to believe that in some way, uh, Dr. Dickinson's work has translated through the decisions of the Delgamuth case and, and the Nishka case, the Supreme Supreme Court cases and our fundamental rights uh, and recognitions by uh, non-Aboriginal people that in fact, yes, we did live here as sovereign nations and we lived here with rich cultures and histories and we survived against the rigors of the harsh environment. Somewhere, somehow, the Creator has been guiding us and protecting us, and, and we have to remember that. And, 
And every loss is, is a message. It's a deep message for all of us. We have gone through a valley of darkness. We've come out of it. And so all these things were great tests of First Nations. But our heritage has always been passed on to this day. So when we look at the value of where we are, it gives us so much to want to live. I'm a fancy shawl dancer. I'm 24. So I have my degree in psychology and Native American studies. I think there is a renewed interest. We've got a lot of people coming in. The powwows are getting bigger and bigger every year. Powwows are important to Native people in that it's an opportunity for us to come together and sort of reconnect. We've got people from all over the U.S. and Canada that are coming into one place. It's a sort of an opportunity to talk to another person from a different community and sort of get a take on what's happening in contemporary culture. And then we've also got an opportunity to find out a little bit more about everyone else's traditions. Everybody sings their own song. Everybody prays in their way. Everybody has their own language. And indigenous people, I think, are the uh, epitome of understanding that diversity because of the way each of the indigenous uh, societies across Canada live within their geographic areas. This is the biggest fish. They are diverse. And I think if Canadian society can accept within its political, economic, and uh, educational aspirations the diverse nature of its own society, then I think we would come uh, to be a truly Canadian society, helping each other, sharing and giving from the heart. When First Nations people were asked to surrender their land, it wasn't their land, it was an impossibility. It was not given them to do that. So they begin to ask important questions of how can we share living on this land? Well, we're here at Alderville's Black Oak Savannah, which is a fairly rare environment in Canada. It's here due to the cooperation of the people of Alderville First Nation who protect it. What is our relationship with this earth? That is the one dialogue, the one question that I do know that First Nations people are interested in, and they are very interested in providing some of the solutions to answer that question. First Nations' role in the United Nations Environmental Program is a stated fact. We are now able to work with our federal agencies to cooperatively manage and preserve these types of environments. We have a unique concept of land ownership which can be brought to bear, and it has everything to do with uh, the concept of sharing, an equivalency, if you will. If you read all of Native peoples in Canada, you'll find it's 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 factual, it's ob, uh, it's objective, and, and it's and it's non non blaming. So that so that there's there's no in quotation marks guilt trips laid on laid on the, the non-Aboriginal population. We have a lot of non-Aboriginal people who are interested in Native studies simply because we're approaching it from this particular perspective. All of sees Canada not simply as a country which was formed from the French European legacy and the British European legacy, but she sees Canada as beginning with uh, First Nations people. 
She wants First Nations to have a proper role in the country as the founding civilization composed of these various First Nations. I'm a great believer in the overall, huh? trying to fit things into the overall. Scholarship very often concentrates on specific areas. It's much easier, much tidier, and you can get a complete picture of a specific area. But in the meantime, you, you miss the context. I am a great believer in trying to incorporate everything into the large picture, as large a picture as you possibly can. And so that's what I did in, in Canada's First Nations, and they brought in the whole history of Canada. I am pleased to announce the recipient of the National Aboriginal Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Olive Patricia Dickinson, Professor Emeritus of the University of Alberta and Adjunct Professor of the University of Ottawa. In the presence of your friends and family, colleagues, and in the presence of all your ancestors, congratulations, and we eagerly look forward to your next book. That's an honor song for Olive Dickinson. <laughs>